continuing our study of the book of Genesis. In the first 11 chapters of Genesis, uh, God uh, tells us about the creation, the fall, the flood, the Tower of Babel, and things were getting bad and bad and bad. Worser and worser and worser. There you go. Things were bad after Adam and Eve sinned. They went out. The world became so wicked, God destroyed it with a flood. After the flood, they went right back to their old habits and created a Tower of Babel to organize a rebellion against God. And then finally God said, enough with all that. And he began a new policy. In the 12th chapter of Genesis, God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees and made him a great promise, told him he would make of him a great nation, give him the land of Canaan, and bless the world through him. It's the Abrahamic covenant, and the rest of the book of Genesis, indeed, the rest of the Old Testament is a story about God going about fulfilling that promise, and he's fulfilled it partially. They are a great nation, not as great as they will be one day. He has to bless the world through the Jewish people. He's, through the Jewish people, he's given us a sacrifice for our sins. And uh, he did give them a portion of the promised land. They occupied a good portion of Canaan, but it will not be completely fulfilled to the millennium. That will be the complete fulfillment of that. Now, we are working, we've already finished uh, examining the first 11 chapters, and that covered the first 2,000 years of history. We're going to be examining the second 2,000 years of history, from the time of Abraham to the time of Christ, and we've already done a brief overview of the life of Abraham, and we've done a brief overview of the life of Isaac, and now we're working our way through the life of Jacob. When God made that promise to Abraham, that promise was going to be fulfilled through Isaac and Jacob, but uh, before we can see how God is working, it's working to fulfill that great Abrahamic covenant through Jacob, we've got to spend a little time with his relationship with his brother Esau, which we did in our last a session together. Oh, by the way, next week we won't have a Sunday evening lecture. Uh, my mother-in-law will be celebrating her 100th birthday. Isn't that amazing? And she's still cooking. And uh, we've got family coming in from all over the country, from California, Arizona, Idaho, North Dakota, and I'm going to be running a taxi service next Sunday evening. So no, nothing sent next Sunday evening, but Lord willing, we'll be back the following week. At any rate, back to Jacob and Esau. We, uh, we examined Jacob and Esau in our last session. Jacob and Esau did not get along. They struggled with each other while they were still in their mother's womb. They were fighting, and then they struggled at birth. Jacob grabbed hold of Esau's heel. That's the reason they named him Jacob, which means supplanter. And they struggled during life. Jacob was a liar and a cheat and a deceiver. And he took advantage of his brother Esau's weakness. When his brother came in from the field, he was weak, and uh, Jacob was making some stew. And he said, I want some stew. And Jacob said, sell me your birthright for the stew. And Esau foolishly did that. And after that, Jacob cheated his brother Esau out of his father's blessing. And uh, this made Esau very unhappy, and Esau threatened to kill Jacob. So <clears throat> Jacob was told by his mother to flee from Esau and their home in Beersheba because Esau wanted to kill him. And on his way from Beersheba to Haram, God met Jacob at, met God, Jacob met God at Bethel. Now, they were living in Beersheba, which is in southern Israel. And um, when Esau threatened to kill Jacob, uh, Jacob's mother, Rebecca, said, you better flee to Haran. Haran is northern Mesopotamia. This is modern-day Iraq. Now, Haran was part of our discussion earlier when we talked about Abraham. When God first spoke to Abraham, he was in Ur of the Chaldees, which is southern Mesopotamia, southern Iraq, and he told him to leave his country and his family. And Abraham was partially obedient. He did leave Ur, and he traveled up the Via Maris, and rather than going on down into Canaan, he took a detour to Haran. And most of you remember that. And uh, so God spoke to him. And also he took his family with him. So God spoke to him again and said, leave your country, leave your family. And he was partially obedient again. He did leave Haran. And he left most of his family. But he took Lot with him and went on down into Canaan. And eventually he and Lot separated. But the point for our discussion this evening in Jacob is that a lot of family was left in Haran. So, we're back here in Beersheba. Esau is threatening to kill Jacob. Uh, Jacob's mother, 
Uh, Rebecca says, go to Haran and stay with my uncle, with my brother Laban, your uncle Laban, my brother. And uh, on the way to Haran, uh, Jacob stops in Bethel to spend the night, and that's where he had that great dream about a ladder stretching from earth to heaven with God at the top of the ladder and the angels uh, going up and down the ladder. And the whole point of that dream was God was going to be pouring out blessings on Jacob, and he was at the top of the ladder, and those angels going up and down would be carrying the blessings to Jacob who was on earth. So, Jacob fled from Esau because Esau wanted to kill him on his way to Beersheba. From Beersheba to Haran, he met God at Bethel. Now, the question we always ask at a time like this is, why would God bless a scoundrel like Jacob? He was a scoundrel. He was a liar and a cheat and a deceiver and a manipulator. But one great thing he had going for him, which was he appreciated the things of God, unlike his brother Esau, who didn't care. Esau could have been the heir to the Abrahamic covenant. Do you realize how magnificent that is? God would be known today as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. Would you consider that an honor? Ah, oh, Esau could care less. He sold that honor for some red stuff. Remember, that's really how you translate the red stew that Jacob was making. He sold it for some red stuff. Now, so Esau didn't appreciate the things God. Jacob did, though. He was a bit of a liar and a cheat and a deceiver in getting it. But God's going to work on that. At least you start with a man who did appreciate the things of the Lord. And so God will be chipping away at him. So from Bethel, after that great uh, visit with God in the dream, and God repeated to him the Abrahamic covenant. To Abraham, I'll make of you a great nation, give you the land of Canaan and bless the world through you. And that covenant was repeated again to Isaac, through whom it would be fulfilled also, and now to Jacob. All three are the patriarchs through whom God will fulfill that promise. So anyway, God repeated the promise. I think at that point, Jacob may well have become a believer at that point, a true believer in God. He, in fact, he committed to giving 10% of everything he got to God. So it seems that he had a commitment to God as well. He continued on to Haran. And when he arrived in Haran, he was, going to be, he was looking for his uncle Laban. And he stopped at a well outside of Haran and asked uh, if uh, anyone knew where Laban lived. And uh, a guy said, well, not only do I know where he lives, here comes his daughter Rachel. She's a shepherdess. She, she came to the well. And Jacob may have fallen in love immediately. We don't know. We know a month later, he was absolutely totally in love with her and was in love with her the rest of his life. He spent 20 years in Haran, and uh, he lived another 70 years. But 20 years in Haran, then he came to Canaan, and Rachel died shortly after they returned to Canaan. So he really only knew her for like 20 years. But on his deathbed, 50 years after that, he was still talking about his beloved Rachel. He fell in love with Rachel. And he wanted her for a wife. After he had been working for his uncle Laban for about a month, he worked a deal with Laban whereby he would work seven years for Rachel. And we're told that he overpaid, but he didn't want to lose her because he loved her. This was a great love story. And uh, also, he didn't, uh, not only did he overpay because he didn't want to risk losing her, he also knew he had a problem, and that was she was the younger, and it was the custom of the day for the older, the older was her sister Leah, the older to marry first. So he overpaid, but he was willing to do it, and we're told that he didn't mind working seven years for her because he was thrilled. Then the great wedding day came, and we know the story. Laban switched, and he ended up marrying Leah, unhappy with that. And, uh, and Laban gave him an excuse about, well, you got to marry the younger first, but finish your one week, your wedding week, with Leah, then I will give you Rachel, but you owe me another seven years. <laughs> so after that, after working seven years, he found himself with two wives and another seven-year obligation. And uh, he did learn some important lessons with his uncle Laban. Jacob the deceiver met the greater deceiver. Jacob the de manipulator met the greater manipulator. Jacob the cheat met the greater cheat, which is what God wanted. Jacob had this going for him. He appreciated the things of God. That Abrahamic covenant to be heir to the promise was great. He, he thought that was incredibly valuable, whereas Esau thought nothing of it. But at the same time, there was a lot of bad stuff that God had to chip away. And uh, his uncle Laban, 
helped him chip some of that away because he, after 20 years of being cheated, he came to realize being a cheat is not such a good thing. Now, <clears throat> after seven years with Uncle Laban, Jacob found himself with two wives, an obligation to work another seven years for the wife he loved, Rachel, and the beginnings of a dysfunctional home. And we call this a dysfunctional psalm. That is not an overstatement. It's an understatement. Let me, I want to read some excerpts. You just need, occasionally we just got to read some large passages of Scripture. I know some of you are familiar with it, but some aren't. And as we read through some excerpts from these two chapters, 29 and 30, you'll get a sense of the big mess that he found himself in. Genesis 29, when God saw that Leah was not loved, sad. This is, we'll talk more about polygamy in a moment. Leah was not loved. He opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Remember, Leah was the one he didn't want to marry, but ended up marrying. And Rachel was the one he loved and had to work another seven years for. But Leah was not loved. He opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben. Or for she said, it is because the Lord has seen my misery. Surely my husband will love me now. Never worked. She conceived again. And when she gave birth to a son, she said, Because the Lord heard that I am not loved, he gave me this one too. So she named him Simeon. Again she conceived. And when she gave birth to a son, she said, Now at last my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. So he's named Levi. She conceived again. And when she gave birth to a son, she said, This time I will praise the Lord. So she named him Judah. And then she stopped having children. When Rachel saw that she was not bearing Jacob any children, she became jealous of her sister. So she said to Jacob, give me children or I die. Jacob became angry with her and said, am I in the place of God who has kept you from having children? Then she said, here is Bilhah, my maidservant. Sleep with her so she can bear children for me and that through her I too can build a family. And this was very much a custom of the day. People tend to be products of their culture, just like us. And this was part of their culture. If a woman couldn't have a child, she could give her husband her handmaiden. The handmaid would bear the child, which would, in a sense, very real sense, belong to the wife. So she gave him her servant Bilhah as a wife. Jacob slept with her. And these were wives. They were secondary wives, but wives nevertheless. Jacob slept with her, and she became pregnant and bore him a son. Then Rachel said, God has vindicated me. He has listened to my plea and given me a son. Because of this, she named him Dan. Rachel's servant Bilhah conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Then Rachel said, I have a great struggle with my sister and I have one. So she named him Naphtali. When Leah saw that she had stopped having children, notice this competition goes, folks. This is going to go on for a while. When Leah saw she had stopped having children, she took her maidservant Zilpah and gave her to Jacob as a wife. Leah's servant Zilpah bore Jacob a son. Then Leah said, what good fortune. So she named him Gad. Leah's servant Zilpah bore Jacob a second son. Then Leah said, how happy I am. The women will call me happy. So she named him Asher. During wheat harvest, Reuben went out into the fields and found some mandrake plants, which he brought to his mother Leah. Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she said to her, wasn't it enough that you took away my husband? A little animosity here. Will you take my son's mandrakes too? I don't know how he felt about being compared to a mandrake, but I guess Jacob, had, with four wives, he learned to live with the squabbling. Wasn't it enough that you took away my husband? Will you also take my mandrakes too? Very well, Rachel said. He can sleep with you tonight in return for your son's mandrakes. So when Jacob came in from the field that evening, Leah went out to meet him. You must sleep with me, she said. I have hired you with my son's mandrakes. So he slept with her that night. God listened to Leah. And she became pregnant and bore Jacob a fifth son. Then Leah said, God has rewarded me for giving my maidservant to my husband. So she named him Issachar. Leah conceived again and bore Jacob a sixth son. Then Leah said, God has presented me with a precious gift. This time my husband will treat me with honor, though it never happened, because I have borne him six sons. So she named him Zebulun. Sometime later she gave birth to a daughter, a daughter and named her Dinah. Then God remembered Rachel. He listened to her and opened her womb. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son and said, God has taken away my disgrace. Finally, Rachel gets a child. She named him Joseph, the great Joseph. And may the Lord add to me another son. Now, Jacob was given 13 children, 
12 sons and one daughters. And what I've done, these are in your notes, I listed the children by each of his four wives. By Leah, he had seven sons, uh, six sons and one daughter. By Rachel, two sons. By Bilhah, for Rachel, two sons. And by Zilpah, for Leah, two sons. Uh, the 13 children, 12 sons and one daughter. Uh, all of them were born in Haran except for one son, and that was Benjamin. Remember, he stayed 20 years in Haran, and in turn he had 12 of his children. He had 11 sons and one daughter. So then they went to Canaan, and as they were journeying through Canaan, uh, Rachel, his beloved Rachel, gave birth to Benjamin and died. So he didn't really have her that long. He, 50 years later, he's still talking about them. That's a great love story. I don't know why they keep having films about David and Bathsheba. This is a much better love story. Now, <clears throat> what I want to do, excuse me, is spend a few minutes talking about the issue of polygamy. It keeps coming up, and for some reason we keep running away from it. So let's just try not to run away from it tonight. And I put the information in your notes that should help you along. Not because we're going to solve all the problems with the issue of polygamy, but there are certain things that we can be certain of about polygamy, some things we can't. You know, when you study the Bible, there are a lot of things that you can be certain of. And other things you just can't be certain of. Now, we have some folks out there that think they've got to be certain about everything, and they end up with a lot of heretical ideas. And some people aren't certain of anything. Well, they're liberal goofballs. <laughs> well, it's just, it's just it's the most silly thing in the world. We can't know anything. What is truth, they say? This is called postmodernism. You can't know anything for certain. That's nonsense. Well, that statement in itself denies poly. It, I can't know anything. That, you know that statement? We can't know anything for certain? How do you know that we can't know anything for certain? That's a certain statement. <laughs> I know, it gets a little ridiculous after a while. Sounds like a bunch of rabbis arguing. But uh, there are some things that we can know a lot about. Just because I don't know everything about the subject, though, doesn't mean I can't know something about it. You saw the point I'm trying to get at here? There are issues that come along like polygamy, and because I can't ev answer every question raised on the subject of polygamy, some say, well, we just can't know anything about polygamy. That's not true. We can know a number of things about it. And so what I want to try to do is go through this issue of polygamy and uh, discuss it. Now, to begin with, God sends us mixed signals. The traditional Christian view of polygamy is that it was prohibited by God, and those men who practiced polygamy were acting sinfully. I've heard this over and over and over again. Let me tell you straight away, that's not true. There's nothing about that statement that is true. It was not prohibited by God, and there's nowhere in the Scriptures that we're told that practicing polygamy was, at, was a sin. This view, is, as I've just pointed out, is not supported by Scripture. Nowhere in Scripture is polygamy prohibited. Nowhere in Scripture is it declared to be sinful. Now, this doesn't mean, however, that God thought well of polygamy. Just because he didn't denounce it doesn't mean he encouraged it. You understand the point I'm trying to make? Well, if you don't denounce it, you're encouraging it. That's ridiculous. Nowhere does God encourage polygamy. Just because he, he doesn't prohibit it, he doesn't call it a sin, but that doesn't mean that he encourages it or even thought well of it. He almost certainly did not think well of it. And it would be wrong to assume that God approved of it. It would be wrong to assume that he declared polygamy a sin. Do you understand it thus far? Okay. Now, let's talk about polygamy for a few moments. To begin with, God sought to regulate it. In Exodus and Deuteronomy, he, had, he discussed the subject of polygamy, and he could have denounced it, but didn't. Instead, he tried to re regulate it. For example, in Exodus 21, God said, If a man marries another woman, he must not deprive the first one of her food, clothing, and marital rights. The idea is a man has a wife, he sees another woman, falls in love, marries her, and he says, don't mistreat the first one. Now, did God prohibit it? He could have. He could have said, don't marry a second one. Didn't say that. But what he did try to do was, 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 was regulate it. And in Deuteronomy 21, God said, if a man has two wives and he loves one but not the other, and that's inevitably what's about to happen in this sort of situation, and both bear him sons, but the firstborn is the son of the wife he does not love, when he wills his property to his sons, he must not give the rights of the firstborn to the son of the wife he loves in preference to the actual firstborn, the son of the wife he does not love. He must acknowledge the son of his unloved wife as his firstborn by giving him a double share of all he has. You get the point. 
just because you don't love this wife, if she gave you the firstborn, you, it's still your firstborn. You can't look over and say, well, this is the wife I love. I'd rather give my, my, the double portion to the son of the wife I love. God says, no, you don't do that. So what God was trying to do here, and another passage is similar to this, was regulate polygamy. Didn't denounce it, didn't prohibit it, he regulated it. And he sought to limit it. And most of you are familiar with this. God says that kings should not take too many wives. It would get you in trouble. And it did. Solomon had way too many. He got him in all sorts of trouble. God blessed David with polygamous marriages to the widows of King Saul. Now, let me give you the background for what we're going to be talking about here. David has committed adultery with Bathsheba and murdered her husband Uriah. All of you are familiar with that story. For about a year and a half, he stubbornly refused to repent. Finally, God says, enough of this nonsense, and sent Nathan to David and challenged David on what had gone down. And the first thing Nathan says is he talks about how God has blessed him. Nathan, go tell David how much I've blessed him. And that's going to be the beginning of the conversation. That's all we're interested in for this subject. And 2 Samuel 12, Nathan said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you. That is, Saul is dead. I gave you his throne, his house. And notice what else God said. And your master's wives into your arms. And that was customary in that day and age for the king of the new dynasty to not only sit on the, previous dy- the, the, the throne of the previous king, but to also take his wives. And this is what, exactly what God did. Notice what God says. I gave you Saul's wives. Now, David already had about six, which means now God was giving him more. So, in fact, God was involving himself in a polygamous exercise, was he not? I'm getting stunned looks. (laughs) I gave your master's house to you. I, God, David, gave Saul's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah, and if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. I loved that. I was willing to give you even more, David. And indeed, indeed, in time, he did. Why did you despise the word of God, the word of the Lord, by doing what is evil in his eyes? That's a reference to killing uh, Uriah and, and, uh, and having adultery with Bathsheba. So God sought to regulate polygamy. He sought to limit polygamy. Don't have too many Wives, kings, God blessed David with polygamous marriages to the widows of King Saul. And God demanded polygamy of the kinsman redeemer. Does everyone, I think many of you understand the idea of the kinsman redeemer, and some of you don't. So let me just give you a little brief rundown of what a kinsman redeemer. God set up a thing in the Old Testament era for protection. Right now we have this great social welfare net and all that business, but you didn't have that in antiquity. And if a man got in a jam like he got into debt because he was less the businessman than he thought he was, and he found himself sold into slavery, God said his closest kinsmen should bail him out. In other words, you got to help each other. And, and, of course, that's a great principle, isn't it? God's principle to all of us as brothers and sisters in Christ is that we need to help each other, right? I, and, and I think you should. <laughs> and, and then when he finishes, you should too, but not me, of course. See, the, question, the question, problem you have with this great command to help one another and love one another is too often we're look, we do it this way. When God says, let me tell you what, let me tell you who's got to do it, the next of kin, and then we keep working our way down until it gets done. So he didn't just sort of leave it open. He says, with a kinsman redeemer, what I want is this, if, my, if, if, a, if, my, if a man gets in trouble, his brother or his closest kin has got to help bail him out. Now, one of the interesting aspects of that was if a man died, he's married, he has a wife, and he dies before they have a child, then his name would die out. And God said, I don't want that to happen. So what I do want to happen is this. His closest kin, preferably his brother, has got to marry his widow, and then their first son will be named after the dead brother. That way, the dead brother's name will continue on posterity. You understand? Now, this demanded polygamy because the living brother might already have a wife or two. So in a very real sense, God in this particular situation demanded polygamy. 
You understand that? So let me just look at these issues again. God sought to regulate polygamy. He did not prohibit it and didn't declare those who were polygamous to be sinful. God sought to limit polygamy. God blessed David with polygamous marriages to the widows of King Saul. And God demanded polygamy of the kinsman redeemer. Now the reason I mention those things is because I don't want to hear this nonsense about God prohibited it and it's sinful to be polygamous. Because you have no basis for statements like that. Do you understand? We've got to get to truth. Now, having said that, some will say, well, I guess God thought polygamy was good. No, he didn't. <laughs> he did not. I know you say, you want everything totally black and white. I'm giving you the issues we understand. And you know, the truth is, if you want to be a good student of Scripture, you've got to learn to appreciate some nuances. There are lots of issues that are really sort of nuanced. And we're going to deal with that even more when we get to Leviticus, where God uh, demanded capital punishment for some sins, but at the same time, he kicked in graciously, and, and people were relieved of it. Well, for example, when the woman, what, what was the penalty for adultery? Death. But when a woman was brought to Jesus who committed adultery, Jesus said, he who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. And he graciously gave, us, gave him a pass. Well, then why would God have a penalty called capital punishment for adultery if he wasn't insisting that adulterers be stoned? This is a simple answer to that. The reason God called adultery, issued, uh, demanded, demanded, uh, laid out the penalty for adultery as being capital punishment is because he wanted people to know the seriousness of the crime. There is an association between the crime and the penalty. If God said adultery is a $20 fine and five days in jail, guess what would happen? Uh, there's a principle. Remember we laid down that an eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, bruise for bruise, fracture for fracture. God, in a very, very real way, what God did in the scriptures was he told us the seriousness of a crime by telling us what the punishment for the crime would be. And what he says is adultery is a very serious crime. That's the reason uh, adulterers sh should be stoned. At the same time, he's a gracious and loving God who didn't want a bunch of them stoned. As a practical matter, they very rarely stoned anybody for adultery. But if he'd said it's a $20 fine and five days in jail, no one would have thought it was serious. But by saying it's a capital offense, it was his way of saying it's an incredibly serious crime. We all recognize that there's an association with the seriousness of the crime and the penalty. At the same time, he didn't want all these adulterous stones, so that's where grace kicked in. You're getting a sense of what's going on here? This is how you've got to sort of appreciate the nuances in Scripture. In any event, God seems to have discouraged polygamy. To begin with, God gave Adam only one wife, and this seems to have been setting a pattern. He didn't give him two or three. He gave him one. And I think that's the pattern God prefers. God demanded the elders set a higher standard, which includes one wife. In the pastoral epistles, which are First and Second Timothy and Titus, God lays down some of the characteristics for elders and deacons in a church. And he does demand more of them. He does demand more of them. And one of the things he said of these elders is they all should be the husband of what, how many wives? One wife. So that, in a very real sense, he's saying that's a higher standard. Having one wife is a higher standard than having several. God also has given us some examples of the horrors of polygamy. And the Bible has a bunch of them. Excuse me. David's children were a mess. He had a number of wives, and he had a number of children. And he was a loving, loving, indulgent father. <laughs> he spoiled them all. And uh, I think the last years of his life, he had more trouble with his children than he did with the Philistines. And much of that sprang from the fact that the children he had from wife A were battling with the children he had from wife B, who were battling with the children he had from wife C, and then A and B would gang up on the children from wife D. You got the drill. It just didn't work. His life and his family were a mess, and it wasn't just a little bit of a problem. It was an enormous problem. In fact, it, it threatened the welfare of the kingdom. So having a bunch of wives with kids with all those wives was a mess. Secondly, 
Second example of horror were David's wives, uh, Solomon's wives. Solomon was a godly man, but he, 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 for diplomatic reasons, married the wives of the, surround, the daughters of the surrounding kings. And they brought with them their idols. And before long, Solomon was actually in there. He bought temp, brought, uh, built temples for them and ended up worshiping their idols. And then finally, Jacob, the man we're discussing. Jacob's polygamous house was a battlefield. And if you go back and read those chapters, it's a lot more than mandrakes, believe me. His household was a battlefield, and to a large extent it was because he had four wives, two primary wives, two secondary wives, and the children he had with each of those wives, would, they would battle with each other. In fact, none of them liked Joseph. Who was his favorite wife? Rachel. And uh, with Rachel, they had Joseph. They all hated him. Well, ja well, Jacob loved Rachel more than the others, so he tended to love his son Joseph, the son of his favorite wife, more than the others. The others sensed it. And they ganged up on Joseph, threatened to kill him, ended up selling him to slavery. You remember the story. We'll be talking about that in a couple of weeks. The point being, Jacob's polygamous household was a battlefield. So God seems to have given men a pass on polygamy, but he also seems to have discouraged it. Adam and Eve, Adam was only given one wife. God demanded elders set a higher standard, which was one wife. And then God has given us a number of examples of the horrors of polygamy. All right, with that, let's proceed on. After 20 years in Haran, he stayed there 20 years. He had to work seven years to get his wives. Well, actually, he worked seven years and ended up with Leah. Had to work another seven uh, to get Rachel, but he got her. He didn't have to wait seven years for her. So, uh, and then what happened was, you see, uh, after he had worked the 14 years for his wives, he worked a deal with Laban to work six more years. Now, the reason for that was Laban saw in Jacob pure gold. He was the the quintessential golden goose, the goose that laid the golden eggs, because God blessed everything that Jacob did. And I don't think Laban was a true believer. He was a polytheistic man. Now, the culture of the day in which they lived was polytheism. Uh, they believed in a variety of gods. I think that, uh, that Laban, well, we know that Laban looked at Jacob and said, your God is blessing you. And some would say, well, then he must be a true believer in the God of Jacob, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, he believed he existed, but that doesn't mean he was a true believer. He had his own gods, and he believed they helped a lot. But Jacob had a really cooking God. And so he worked out a deal with Jacob. That Jacob worked another six years, and he would pay him. And he was going to pay him in giving uh, Jacob some animals of his own, which Jacob would then raise and... You get the idea. And what happened was Jacob had worked for his uncle a total of four, uh, 20 years. He worked 14 for two wives. He worked an additional six years. And Laban saw that God blessed him. That's the reason. And Jacob's wealth, God really blessed Jacob during those six years tremendously. His wealth grew, and he grew in rich in cattle, sheep, goats, donkeys, and camels. We read about it in Genesis chapter 30 and 31. Jacob grew exceedingly prosperous and came to own large flocks and maidservants and men servants and camels and donkeys. Jacob heard that Laban's sons were saying, Jacob has taken, now the problem comes. See, Laban's sons are growing resentful of Jacob's prosperity. Jacob had taken everything our father owned and has gained all this wealth from what belonged to our father. And Jacob noticed that Laban's attitude toward him was not what it had been. So Jacob has been in here in 20 years, and he's getting ready to leave. And the reason he's leaving is, first of all, because Laban and his sons were growing resentful of his prosperity. God was blessing Jacob more than he was blessing the flocks of Laban that Jacob was taking care of. And people just get ridiculously jealous and Laban and his sons were jealous. The second reason was God told Jacob to return home. home. In Genesis 31, the, God, the Lord said to Jacob, Go back to the land of your fathers, to your relatives, and I will be with you. So Jacob sent word to Rachel and Leah to come out to the fields where his flocks were. He said to them, I see that your father's attitude toward me is not what it was before, but the God of my father has been with me. Two primary reasons for leaving, Laban and his sons were growing resentful of Jacob, and God told Jacob to return home. Twenty years is enough. Now, in typical Jacob fashion, he slipped away. God's working on this guy. 
but he still has a ways to go. <laughs> then Jacob put his children and his wives on camels, and he drove all his livestock ahead of him along with all the goods he had accumulated in Padamaran. Padamaran is that region around the city of Haran. He, uh, to go to his father Isaac in the land of Canaan. Moreover, Jacob deceived Laban the Aramean by telling him he was running, by not telling him he was running away. So he fled with all he had, and crossing the river, he headed for the hill country of Gilead. Laban was not too happy about this. To begin with, he saw Jacob's prosperity as his own. It wasn't. And he also didn't want to lose Jacob because the God of Jacob was making everything that Jacob did, what? Prosperous. So Laban was not happy. He rounded up his men and he gave chase. But then God came to Laban in a dream and said, back off. Don't mess with this guy. He's my guy. Now, some would say, well, he must have believed in this God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He believed he existed along with a bunch of other gods. That's not a true believer. Do you understand being a true believer, God says, let me tell you who I am. I'm one God. Now, if you believe the whole, I'm just one among many, you haven't really believed in me because you haven't believed I am who I claim to be. Do you understand the difference here? People say, well, I believe in him along with all the other gods. No, because he claims to be the only God, and if you don't accept him as the only God, then you haven't really believed in him. So anyway, on the third day, Laban was told that Jacob had fled. Taking his relatives with him, he pursued Jacob for seven days and caught up with him in the hill country of Gilead. Then God came to Laban the Aramean in a dream at night and said to him, Be careful not to say anything to Joseph, either good or bad. Laban caught up with Jacob, as just pointed out, in Gilead. Let me tell you where that is. Here's Haran, northern Mesopotamia. So you're following the Via Maris on down. Gilead is the region just southeast of the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, and north of a river called the Jabbok River. So it was right here in Gilead that uh, Laban caught up with Jacob, and a lot of interesting things are going to happen around the Jabbok River. Let's go back to what happened. Laban caught up with him and then gave a lame excuse about throwing a going away party. <laughs> and the man can't tell the truth no matter what. Then Laban said to Jacob, what have you done? You've deceived me. You've carried off my daughters like captives in war. They were actually his wives, Laban. Why did you run off secretly and deceive me? Why didn't you tell me so I could send you away with joy and singing to the music and tambourines and harps? You, know, you didn't even let me kiss my grandchildren and my daughters goodbye. You have done a foolish thing. I have the power to harm you, but last night the God of your father said to me, be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. Now, Jacob knew that Laban's com complaint was nonsense. Jacob knew that Laban would have cheated him. Of course, he would have. Uh, and this is what, how Jacob responded. He said, I have been with you for 20 years now. You sh your sheep and goats have not miscarried, nor have I eaten rams from your flocks. I did not bring you animals torn by wild beasts. I bore the loss myself. And you demanded payment from me for whatever was stolen by day or night. This was my situation. The heat consumed me in the daytime and the cold at night, and sleep fled from my eyes. It was like this for the 20 years I was in your household. I worked for you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flocks, and you changed my wages 10 times. The deceiver meets the greater deceiver. If the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had not been, been with me, you would have surely sent me away empty-handed. But God has seen my hardship and the toil of my hands, and last night he rebuked you. Okay, there are two primary reasons for leaving Haran. One, uh, Jacob saw that Laban was getting a bad attitude toward him. Plus, God said it's time to leave. In typical Jacob fashion, he slipped away secretly. Laban chased after him. He caught up with him in Gilead. And Jacob knew that Laban's complaint was nonsense. Uh, and, that, and he knew that Laban would cheat him. But they ended up parting. Laban returned to Haran. But Jacob's problems are not over. Why did he run to Haran to begin with? Because Esau wanted to kill him. Now he's back in the killing turf. He's back in Canaan where he's got a brother that wanted to kill him. So he's got to come up with a plan to pacify Esau. 
Truth is, he didn't need to pacify Esau, but he didn't know it. Esau had a lot of flaws, but holding grudges was not one of them. But Jacob didn't know that, so he came up with a strategy to pacify his brother. To begin with, he sent a messenger to Esau with an apology. And Esau responded by coming to Jacob with 400 men, and Jacob was scared witless. 400 men? Actually, it was a welcome party, but Jacob didn't know it. So he starts to panic. And what he does, he starts, uh, he divided his family into two groups so that if one was attacked, the other could escape. And then he prayed to God for help. Always a good thing to do when you're in a jam. <laughs> then Jacob prayed. You Pentecostals would have done that first off, wouldn't you? I know you. I know you. Great prayer warriors. Then Jacob prayed, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, go back to your country. And he's reminding God that God sent him back. And I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I have become two groups. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau. For I am afraid he will come and attack me and also the mothers with their children. But you have said, I will surely make you prosper and will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. Jacob then sent Esau a lot of valuable gifts. So now he's, he's come up with a strategy. He sent a messenger apologizing. Esau responded by coming after him with 400 men, but they really a welcome party. He didn't understand. He divided his family into two groups, so if one got attacked, the other could escape. He prayed to God, and then he sent Esau a lot of valuable gifts, and he spread them out to make them look good and bigger than what they were. He spent the night there, and from what he had with him, he selected a gift for his brother Esau, 200 female goats, 20 male goats, 200 ewes, and 20 rams, 30 female camels with their young, 40 cows and 10 bulls, and 20 female donkeys and 10 male donkeys. He put them in the care of his servants, each herd by itself, and said to his servants, go ahead of me and keep some space between the herds. In other words, I want my brother Esau to see what an enormous gift. Don't jump it all jumbled it all up in one big mass because he won't appreciate the enormity of it. Slick guy. Uh, then he went to bed. Jacob had done all he could do. You thought that was funny. Yeah. Had done all he could do to pacify his brother, so he went to bed, but he couldn't sleep. And then one of the most interesting things recorded in the Bible took place. He wrestled with God all night. And you're going to look at me like I'm going to tell you why, and I really don't know. <laughs> well, I know something of what happened. Again, it's one of those issues, one of those issues we can know some things, we just don't know all of it. But because we don't know all of it doesn't mean we don't know some of it. You know, I'm going to keep emphasizing this because I hear it all the time. Unless I can answer absolutely every question you might have about a particular issue, then we can't know anything. That's absurd, folks. That's absurd. There's a lot of things we don't know. But there's a bunch of stuff we do know. So let's talk about Jacob wrestling God. It all took place in Gilead. He sent everybody over. And Esau's coming up from Edom, which is south. Remember from our story, our lectures on, on uh, geology. He's coming up from Edom in the south of the, the Dead Sea. And he sent everybody over, and now he's by himself. He can't sleep. And so that night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maidservants, and 11 sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the, sockets, the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob but Israel, because you have struggled with whom? God, and with men, and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called that place Peniel, saying, it is because I saw God face to face, yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Now, 
much, as I pointed out about this event, is mysterious, but there are some things that we can be reasonably certain of. To begin with, initially, Jacob did not know that this man was God. You understand what has happened. God has put on flesh. It's called in theology of what? Theophany. And it happens throughout the Old Testament. Occasionally, the second person of the Godhead will come down as an angel or as a man and involve himself in the affairs of mankind. We've talked about them on a number of occasions. In this particular case, God put on skin. He came down as a man and wrestled with Jacob. But Jacob, if Jacob known that was God initially, he would not have wrestled him. He would have worshipped him. Now, Jacob was a stubborn, willful man, but he was not a fool. If he knew this was God, he would have collapsed in front of him. So initially, he didn't know that it was God. In time, however, he came to realize that the man was God because he says, I saw God face to face, yet my life was spared. Exactly when it dawned on him it was God, I don't know. But in time, he did come to believe it was God, know it was God. Jacob had no chance of winning, of course. This match was unfair. He was a 97-year-old man. How could a 97-year-old man defeat a 20, a, a, the living God? Well, how can a 20-year-old man defeat the living God? This was not, but in the end, this was not really a physical contest. God was trying to bring Jacob to the end of himself. God was trying to break Jacob's spiritual rebellion. Jacob had been stubbornly refusing to surrender all to God for years, and Jacob spent most of that refusing to surrender. He wrestled him all night. This was a wrestling match, physical wrestling match, whose greater issue, the, who which was really a spiritual wrestling match. God came down and wrestled him physically, but it was really about a spiritual. Jacob was a true believer, but he was a true believer who had not surrendered his all from God to God. And it's almost like God said, tonight we're going to straighten this issue out. I'm going to put on skin. I'm going to come down, and we're going to go at it physically. But the real issue is spiritual. You are not surrendering yourself to me completely, and tonight you're going to do it, and we're going to do it in a wrestling match. God was trying to bring Jacob to the end of himself. Instead of defeating Jacob immediately, God deliberately chose to continue the match with Jacob throughout the night. Now, he could have nailed him initially, right? But God, notice he's continuing this thing. In fact, he says he couldn't, he couldn't overthrow him. But how, of course God could overthrow him, so it had to be another issue, a spiritual issue. And he, excuse me, let me continue. Instead of defeating Jacob immediately, God deliberately chose to continue the match with Jacob throughout the night. And he did so because he wanted to bring Jacob to the end of himself. He wanted Jacob to become so exhausted in this physical wrestling match with God that he would in turn become exhausted with his spiritual wrestling match with God. To understand this, you must understand that Jacob had been having a spiritual wrestling match with God throughout his life. Years earlier, Jacob had become a genuine believer and a worshiper of the living God. But he was a believer who had not fully surrendered himself to God and God's will for his life. Does that sound familiar to anyone? To the contrary, for years, Jacob had been struggling against God's will for his life. For years, Jacob had been struggling to do things his way, own way, as opposed to God's way. Amen to that. For years, Jacob had been struggling to be the master of his own fate and the captain of his own soul, as opposed to allowing God to be the master of his fate and the captain of his soul. For years, Jacob had been struggling against God's desire to run Jacob's life. When God put on skin and came to earth to have a physical wrestling match with Jacob, he did so because he wanted to put an end to the spiritual wrestling match that he and Jacob had been having. God's plan was to accomplish this by defeating Jacob in a physical wrestling match that would force Jacob to put an end to their spiritual wrestling match. And this was not an easy task because Jacob was a stubborn and self-willed man who was not easily broken. In fact, it apparently took all night to break Jacob because we read in verse 25 that God could not initially overpower Jacob. Or as one writer put it, the old, carnal, stubborn, fighting, self-sufficient, unyielding Jacob was still very much alive and refused to be overpowered. So the battle went all night. Now, God could easily have overpowered Jacob physically and done so in a nanosecond. So when we read in verse 25 that God could not overpower Jacob, the writer was not speaking about God physically overpowering Jacob. He was speaking of God spiritually overpowering Jacob. God wanted to spiritually overpower Jacob, not physically overpower Jacob. And this is a key. God can physically overpower anybody he wants to, but to 
to gain control of us spiritually requires not only God to push us, but it requires us to what? Surrender. God will not overpower. God wants every one of us to be totally, absolutely, and fully committed to him. But, and he's good, he encourages us, and he puts us into circumstances that encourages that, us. But he won't overpower your will and force you to totally surrender. He just won't. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies living sacrifices, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable purpose. Romans 12, we all know the passage. What God is doing is he's pleading with us to surrender completely. Now, if it was all a matter of just waving a wand and it would all happen, there was no need for the passage. What God is doing in that passage, he's urging us to exercise our wills and surrender to him. And in this particular case, God is doing it in a wrestling match, a physical wrestling match, but really what he's after is spiritual surrender. And uh, Jacob held out all night long. God wanted to overpower Jacob's will so that he would completely surrender his will to God's will. We aren't exactly, we don't, we, we aren't told exactly how this physical wrestling match put an end to their spiritual wrestling match. But we do know that it did, and we know this to be the case for a number of reasons. Breaking Jacob's flesh spoke of breaking Jacob's will. Remember, God wrenched his hip. And that's God's way of telling us. Says, we, I can't see Jacob's will. I can't see his heart. But God touched his hip, and it wrenched it, and he limped for the rest of his life. And that was God's way of telling us that God broke, in breaking his flesh, he broke his fleshy will. So God's way of telling you, you get little hints in the Bible about what's going on. That's one of the hints. Name changes speak of new beginnings. He changed his name. And that often in the Bible speaks of a new beginning. When God established the covenant of circumcision with Abraham, he says, your name is no longer Abram, but Abraham, and Sarah is Sarah. When Peter came to Jesus, he changed his name. Then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus. Looking intently at Simon, Jesus said, your name is Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas, which means Peter. Name change. A change in your life, Peter. There's a Dramatic change in your life taking place right now, and I'm going to change your name. Dramatic change in, in, in the covenant with God made with Abraham when he established the covenant of circumcision. He changed his name. And so it was with Jacob. The name Jacob meant supplanter. Who is a supplanter? One who takes advantage of others through scheming and deception. Was that Jacob? Absolutely. He said, but now you're going to be called Israel, which means God rules. God rules your heart now, Jacob. Had God broken Jacob? I mean, our point here is we're saying, how do we know that God broke Jacob's will? Because this name changed. He went from being the supplanter to one whom God rules. And from one who was, was, was fighting against God's will, one who now is a fighter for God. After 20 years in Haran, I'm going to sum it up and we'll close. It was time to return home. There are two primary reasons for leaving Haran. Laban and his sons were growing resentful of Jacob's prosperity, and God told Jacob to return home. In typical fashion, Jacob slipped away secretly. Laban changed after Jacob. Laban caught up with him in Gilead and gave the lame excuse that he was angry he couldn't throw a going-away party. Talk about spin control. I mean, this is where the politicians in Washington get their training, guys from Laban. What a spin. Jacob knew that Laban's complaint was nonsense. Jacob knew that Laban would have cheated him, and he would have. Jacob then had a new problem. He attempted to pacify Esau. Twenty years earlier, Esau wanted to kill Jacob. Jacob was forced in the end to wrestle with God. Why? God was trying to bring Jacob to the end of himself. And guess what, folks? He did just that. That's a great story about how God took a man named Jacob, a supplanter, a man who uses cheating and stealing and manipulation to take what belongs to others. God took that man and molded him and shaped him into a man whose heart is ruled by God. And that's what he's doing with all of us. That's the reason we go through some of the wrestling matches that we go through. And if you're not in one right now, just hold on, you will. Next week, nothing. Following week, Lord willing, we'll be back. Father, we love you. We worship you. We thank you for being our God. I pray we learn from our brother Jacob, great man. I pray we learn to surrender a little bit earlier and save some of this grief. In the meantime, I pray, Lord, you'll give my brothers and sisters a good week.
bless them, I pray in Jesus' name.